Okay, so this is a pre-recording of the lecture for Monday, March 28th. As a reminder, we're not meeting in person for lecture on that day. Instead, you're going to watch this recording from home. But everything else during that week is as usual. So you're going to be meeting in person for the Wednesday lecture, and you're going to be meeting in person for your labs during this week. Okay? And another quick reminder is about the upcoming test. So the test is going to be on Monday, April 4th, and it's going to cover capacitors, resistance and current, and DC circuits. So what we're going to do today is finish up our lecture on DC circuits. The last topic we need to hit on in that lecture is RC circuits. And this, of course, is going to appear on the upcoming test. So let's get into it. I want to take sort of a big picture look at what we've learned so far about how to analyze the circuit. We've learned about Kirchhoff's rules, and we've learned how to apply them to a DC circuit. Now, in a situation where the circuit only has batteries and resistors, nothing else, the resulting equations can be solved algebraically. Because basically, if you just have a bunch of batteries and a bunch of resistors, there's some number of unknown currents that you have to solve for. And those currents are just numbers, all right? The solution for I1, I2, I3, whatever the set of currents happens to be, is just a set of numbers, all right? And those currents, therefore, are constant and not changing over time. However, if we have an RC circuit, that's a circuit where you have batteries, capacitors, and resistors all together, if you apply Kirchhoff's rules to that type of circuit, you're not going to get just an algebraic equation where you solve it and you get a number out. Instead, you're going to get a differential equation as a result of that. Now, solving a differential equation requires calculus, right? It's, there's more to it than just algebraically solving for some constants. So I'll show you how that works. But the result of this is going to be the solutions will be currents as a function of time. So rather than just some constant value for the current, you're gonna get some kind of function of time out. So we say I is a function of T, okay? And what again that is telling us is that the currents are changing in time, they're not just constant. All right, so to set the stage, um, we're gonna do a few very quick conceptual sort of questions. So this is an example of an RC circuit because it has those components that we talked about. We have a battery, we have a resistor here, another one here, and a capacitor. So let's suppose that in this uh, circuit, the battery has an EMF of 10 volts, the resistors are both 10 ohms, and the capacitor is 10 microfarads. Initially, the capacitor is uncharged, and the switch that you see here is open. Okay, so what we do, is we take the switch and we throw it to position A. What that allows us to do is charge the capacitor because it's now going to be directly connected to the battery. The question is, what is the current through the resistor and the charge on the capacitor immediately after the switch is thrown? So immediately after we throw the switch to position A, what is the current and what is the charge on the capacitor? That's the question. So you're watching this from home. Pause the video, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay. So, um, let's draw a picture of our circuit. Now, first of all, the branch on the uh, right side is not connected to anything, so we can just ignore it. We just need to draw the battery, the resistor on top here, which we'll label R, and the capacitor on this side, which we'll label as C, okay? So this is the positive terminal of the battery. This is the negative terminal. So as we know, what's gonna happen as uh, time goes on is current is gonna flow from the positive terminal like this. So that's our current I. And if current is flowing in this direction, that means charge, positive Q, is going to be accumulating on this top plate. And then charge, negative Q, is going to be accumulating on this bottom plate of the capacitor. Okay? But 
at, let's say, t equals 0, that's when the switch is thrown. Okay, what we have is q is equal to 0. Because basically, no time has passed. For charge to start building up. Okay? So we don't have any charge yet uh, at the instant the switch is thrown. And since we know that, let's write down the loop rule for this circuit, Kirchhoff's loop rule. It says if we sum up the voltages going in a loop around the circuit, uh, those have to equal zero. So how about we do this? Let's start down here. Let's go across the battery from the negative to the positive terminal, which gives us epsilon, positive. Then we go across the resistor in the direction of the current. So that's minus IR for the voltage drop across the resistor. And then lastly, we're going across the capacitor plates. We're going from the positive plate to the negative plate. Uh, and since we're going from the positive plate to the negative plate, there is a voltage drop, a negative voltage across the capacitor, which is given by minus QC. Okay, so that's the loop rule. And of course, we're back where we started, so now we can set that equal to zero. But what we're saying is Q is zero at the uh, instant when we throw the switch. So that term Q over C just goes to zero. So we have epsilon minus IR equals zero, which gives us I equals epsilon divided by R. Epsilon is 10 volts, R is 10 ohms, which means we have exactly one amp of current at the instant the switch is thrown. And again, we have no charge uh, at the instant the switch is thrown. Okay. So let's take a look at a follow-up to this one. So here's what's going on. It's the same circuit, uh, so the same values for epsilon, r, and c. Um, and initially, as before, the capacitor is not charged and the switch is open. Uh, and we throw the switch to position A to charge the capacitor. So same scenario as before. The question, though, is... What is the current through the resistor and the charge on the capacitor a very long time after the switch is thrown? Okay, so we throw the switch to position A, we wait, we wait a very, very long time. Uh, what's going to be happening uh, in that case? So let's go through it. So this is the, uh, the next question, but it's based on the same circuit, so I'm going to leave that drawing of the circuit up here. If we wait a long enough time, the capacitor is going to be fully charged. Okay, this is something you should remember from the capacitors lab that you did a couple weeks back. When you charge a capacitor, current flows through it, uh, current flows to it for a while, but then that current stops flowing once the capacitor is fully charged. So if you wait long enough, the capacitor will be fully charged, and because of that, current stops flowing. Okay, this is something you saw with your own eyes in that lab. So I equals zero. And we can then use the same loop rule that we wrote down earlier to figure out what Q is supposed to be. So we have epsilon minus IR minus Q divided by C equals zero, but this time it's the current that's zero, all right? Which means epsilon minus Q divided by C equals zero, and that means Q is equal to epsilon times C. So that's the final charge that the uh, capacitor is going to have on it, okay? And so epsilon is 10 volts, C is 10 microfarads, so that's 10 times 10 to the minus 6 farads, and remember a farad is a coulomb, 
per volt. Okay? Uh, so what this comes out to is a 100, 100 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, or we could say 100 microcoulombs. So to reiterate, at the very beginning, when you just start to charge the capacitor, Q is equal to zero because no time has elapsed for charge to accumulate on those plates. And the current is one amp. That's the biggest current you're going to have. Then if you wait a really long time, the capacitor is going to be fully charged, which means there's no longer any current. And that final charge is just the battery voltage times C, which in this case worked out to 100 microcoulombs. Okay, so that's just a qualitative picture about what's going on at the very beginning and at the very end of the charging process. But what we're going to do in today's lecture is figure out what's going on in between. So specifically, how is the current and the charge changing over time in a more detailed way? Okay, so another question to get you thinking about RC circuits. Same circuit that we had before. Same epsilon, r, and c values. But now, we're imagining the switch has been in position A for a very long time. And as we know, that means the capacitor is fully charged uh, at this uh, moment. And then what we do, after the switch has been in position A for a very long time, is we throw it to position B. Now, here's what's happening when we throw the switch to position B. We basically take the battery out of the circuit. It's no longer connected to anything uh, in a closed loop. So what we have is just the capacitor directly connected to this resistor in a loop. And what that's going to do is discharge the capacitor. So when we had the switch in position A, we connected the capacitor to the battery. We were charging it. But now when we just connect the capacitor to this resistor, we are discharging it. So the question here is, what direction is the current flowing while the capacitor is discharging in this circuit? Is it going to be going clockwise or is it going to be going counterclockwise? So again, pause the video for a second and see if you can work this out. Uh, again, try drawing the circuit that's shown on the right side now and uh, see what you come up with. Okay. So this is the third question about the RC circuit. Let's do it down here. Now what we have is the capacitor. And as we saw before, the top plate is the one with the positive charge. The bottom plate is the one with the negative charge. And now that's just directly connected to a resistor. So this is R and C. And that's it. Again, the battery is no longer part of the circuit. So Question is, what direction is current going to flow? Well, whenever we say current, remember, we mean conventional current, which indicates the flow of positive charge within your circuit. And if we think about the way positive charges are going to want to move, well, positive charge would tend to be repelled from this positive plate. And if it's repelled from the positive plate, it has nowhere to move except up this wire and then around and then be attracted to this negative plate down here, right? So positive charge is repelled from other positive charge and attracted to negative charge. The path for it to move is this, okay? And it looks to me like if positive charge is moving this way, that's clockwise, okay? So we're gonna have a clockwise current in this case. All right, so that's our discharging circuit with the current basically flowing in the opposite direction as before. Okay. Um, so now what we're gonna do is come up with some equations, right? We're gonna look at the same circuit that we saw before as our kind of example. Um, but, you know, there's nothing special about this particular circuit. What we're gonna get is a general equation for RC circuits describing the amount of current and the amount of charge in the circuit um, while we're charging, okay? So this is what we're gonna use to figure out what those equations look like. So here's the circuit. 
uh, we have a battery, we have a capacitor, we have a resistor here and a resistor here, and we have a switch. Okay, let's say that at T equals zero, that's when we throw the switch to position A and we start to charge the capacitor. And by the way, the capacitor starts off uncharged. That's the assumption we're gonna make. So Q is equal to zero to start, but then at T equals zero, we throw the uh, switch to position A and it begins to charge. That's what's going on. Okay, so now the switch is in position A and as we see, we have the battery, this resistor and the capacitor all connected in a loop, and this resistor is uh, not connected to anything, so we can just neglect it for this analysis. Okay, as we said, um, what direction will current flow? Well, current uh, is gonna flow this way. Um, it's gonna flow off the positive terminal of the battery, and positive charge is gonna collect on this top plate of the capacitor, uh, and negative charge uh, is going to accumulate on this bottom plate. That's conventional current, remember. Uh, actual flow of electrons would be going the other way, okay? Uh, but we're just keeping track of the conventional current here, and that's the direction. So like I said, if we have conventional current flowing uh, this way, flowing in a clockwise direction, uh, then what happens is positive charge is going to start building up on this plate because that's where the current sort of terminates and the current is coming off of here so this plate is losing positive charge so it becomes negative, okay? So we have plus Q minus Q on the plates of the capacitor. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and write down Kirchhoff's loop rule for this circuit. Um, and this is just like what I showed you before. Let's just go through it again. I have uh, this loop and I'm going to take it going clockwise and we're going to sum up all the voltages in that loop as we go around uh, and come back to where we started. So let's start here and we'll go across the battery from the negative to the positive terminal, which gives us positive epsilon as our voltage. Then we go across the resistor in the direction that the current is flowing. So that's minus IR for that voltage. Then we go across the capacitor from the positive plate to the negative plate, which is minus Q over C. So I explained why that's the case before, but that's the equation. And of course it equals zero because we summed up the voltages in a loop and it has to equal zero. So here's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna do this on paper um, and work out the result, but basically, what I'm going to show you is this right here is a differential equation and we're going to have to use calculus methods in order to solve it. So let's do that work and see what the result is. Okay, so we're going to start with this. The loop rule equation said epsilon minus um, I times I, I times R, sorry, uh, minus Q divided by C equals zero. Now that doesn't look like a differential equation yet. A uh, differential equation has you know, derivatives in it. Um, but let's remember the definition of current. What is current in the first place, right? It's the charge per unit time flowing through the wires of our circuit. In other words, we could write this as dq dt, okay? And if we insert that in for i right here, then we'll see we have a differential equation because we have epsilon minus dq dt times r minus q divided by c equals zero. And that's definitely a differential equation. If we solve for it, we can get q the charge on the capacitor plates as a function of time. And then later, if we take the derivative of that, then we'll have the current flowing through the wires as a function of time. Um, so anyway, let's rearrange this. The goal here is to separate out the Q terms, the charge terms from the T terms, which are the time terms. Um, so here's how I'll do that. Um, first, I'm gonna multiply through by C 
So my first term is now epsilon c. And my second term is negative, but I'm going to add it to both sides and put it over here. So we have dq dt, and then remember I multiplied through by c, so we have rc. And then my last term is just minus q, since I've multiplied through by c. Right? So just a slight manipulation of the equation. There it is. Next, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to um, divide both sides by this term, epsilon c minus q. And I'm going to divide both sides by rc and multiply both sides by dt. So the dt goes over here, the rc goes on the bottom over here, and this term, epsilon c minus q, goes on the bottom over here, which gives us dt divided by rc equals dq divided by epsilon c minus q. Okay, so just again, we're just rearranging the terms and we're getting this result. Now this is useful that we've separated out the two variables because now what we can do is integrate both sides. And here's what it looks like when we integrate both sides. Uh, I have the integral of dt divided by rc equaling the integral of dq divided by epsilon c minus q. But now let's put limits of integration on this thing. Well, for the time limits on the left side, I'm going to go from 0, because t equals 0 is when we close the switch. So that makes sense. It would be my lower time limit. And for my upper time limit, I don't want to say anything too specific, um, because we want to be able to plug in any time that we want. So I'll just call the upper limit t. So we're going from time 0, which is the start of the charging process, to time t, which is just some arbitrary time later. Okay, on this side, the limits of integration have to be q values. They have to be charge values. Well, we start off with zero charge, so that's my bottom limit. And my top limit, again, I don't want to put anything specific here. Let's just say it's q t. It's the charge at time t, okay? That's how we're going to do this. So. This is my left-hand side. I'm going to write this as LHS. That's my time integral. And this is my right-hand side. What we're going to do is evaluate those separately, um, just so we're not trying to do two integrals at the same time. And then at the end, we'll set them equal to each other. All right. For my left-hand side, that's the easy one. I have RC as constants, which I can immediately pull out of the integral which is 1 over rc, 0 to t, dt. What's the integral from 0 to t of dt? It's just t. That's a trivial integral. So we have t over rc. For the right-hand side, this is going to take a little more work. Um, here's what I suggest for the right-hand side. I'm going to do a u substitution where u is equal to epsilon c minus q. And that means du, if we work it out, taking the derivative of this thing, epsilon c, that's just constants. And this derivative uh, just becomes uh, minus dq. So we have du equals minus dq. Now let's also think about how the limits change if we're doing this particular u sub. If q is equal to 0, that's my bottom limit. Um, that's not necessarily the same as my bottom limit for the variable u, because u is epsilon c minus plugging in 0 for q. So my, so my new bottom limit is epsilon c. Okay, for my top limit, I'm saying q is q at time t. That's what we're saying. But then for my u, I'm going to have epsilon c minus q at time t. Okay, just plugging in the q value right there. So my integral is now from epsilon c to epsilon c minus qt. Um, dq 
is minus du, as we just stated up here, and epsilon c minus q is just u. So that's a useful substitution because that's a pretty easy one to evaluate as far as integrals go. So uh, 1 over u integrated becomes the natural log of u, and we have this negative sign up front. And we're taking that between the limits that we said earlier. So now what I have to do is um, plug in the limits. So I have minus natural log epsilon c minus qt minus natural log epsilon c. And when I have two terms subtracted from one another, each with a natural log, um, I can, I can uh, bring them inside of the same natural log through division. So I have minus natural log, um, I'm going to have epsilon c minus qt on top, and epsilon c on the bottom. Okay, so, so this is the right-hand side integral, it works out to this. This is the left-hand side integral. Let's set them equal. Okay, if left-hand side equals right-hand side, we have um, t divided by rc equals minus natural log epsilon c minus qt over epsilon c. Okay? This negative sign, uh, it's just going to be a little more convenient for me to move it over to this side. So try this, like try multiplying both sides by minus 1. We'll get positive over here, and then we'll have a negative sign over here. Okay? And remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to find q as a function of time. We're trying to sort of describe how the charge is changing over time. So if I'm trying to solve for this, I better get rid of the natural log that's shown here. The way to do that is to exponentiate. So I'm going to take e to the power of both sides of the equation. When I take e to the natural log as a power, I basically undo the natural log. So Here's what it looks like. I have e to the minus t over rc equals, now I've undone the natural log, so I have epsilon c minus qt divided by epsilon c. Um, I can slightly rewrite this as epsilon c times e to the minus t over rc by putting this uh, divided term over here equals epsilon c minus qt. I'm trying to solve for qt. So that's going to be, um, take this negative term, add it to both sides, puts it over here. Take this term, subtract it from both sides, puts it over here. So we have qt equals epsilon c minus epsilon c times e to the minus t over rc. And then just as a final step, I'm going to write it this way. We have epsilon c times 1 minus e to the minus t over rc, just to factor out the epsilon c. So um, that is how charge is changing over time on our capacitor plates. That's the result. Now, if we want to know how current is changing over time, uh, remember, current is the derivative of q with respect to time. It's dq dt. So if we take our result for q and we take its time derivative, here's what we get. Okay, the first term right here is epsilon c. That's just the constant. So when we take its derivative, we get zero. The second term is minus epsilon c. That's the constants out front here. And then we're taking the derivative of e to the minus t over rc. By the chain rule, we're going to bring out a minus 1 over rc. That's the derivative of what's in the exponent. And then we'll have e to the minus t over rc. And to simplify, we have two negatives, and c's will cancel. So we have epsilon divided by r, 
e to the minus t over rc. So we've accomplished what we've wanted to accomplish. We've got q as a function of time in the rc circuit and i as a function of time in the rc circuit. So this is telling you how the charge is building up on the plates as the capacitor charges. This is telling you how the current is changing uh, as the capacitor charges. So those are the results. Let's summarize. <clears throat> the RC circuit charging equations are like this. I of T is equal to some kind of maximum current, which I'm going to call I naught times E to the minus T over RC. Q of T is equal to Q naught, some kind of maximum charge times one minus E to the minus T over RC. And just to remind you, the uh, maximum charge that appears out front, that was the epsilon C term. So when we say Q naught, what we're referring to is the epsilon C term out front. And I naught, the maximum current, is the epsilon divided by R term. That was out front in our current equation, okay? So that's how you describe a charging RC circuit in terms of both of these factors. And it's useful to graph these results to just kind of see what they look like. <clears throat> so let's start with the current. Basically, this is an exponential decay, right? Because you have some maximum value of the current at t equals zero, and then you're just multiplying that by this exponentially decaying function. Um, so if you plot it, we start off at that maximum value, and then we asymptotically approach zero as time gets bigger and bigger. Now, RC, as we're going to see, like resistance times capacitance, RC, uh, kind of plays a special role in this equation. And so what we'll see is, imagine for the time that you plugged into uh, the time R times C right here. Then you would just have E to the minus 1, right? Well, if you calculate E to the minus 1, it's about 0.37. So that means after a time that's equal to RC, you're at 0.37 of your maximum current that you started with. Okay, if you plug in two times RC for the time, well, then you're just going to have E to the minus 2 right here. And if you calculate what E to the minus 2 is, it's 0.14. So that's saying after two times RC, we're at only 0.14 of our initial current. And then again, you do the same thing for 3RC. If you have e to the minus 3, that's 0.05. So uh, it's just showing you how the current is falling off uh, over time. But those are some of the numbers that would appear on the graph. All right, for charge, it's not the same exact equation. It's not an exponential decay. It's 1 minus some kind of exponentially decaying function times our maximum charge. So actually, if you think about what's going on here, okay, initially, if we have time zero, we have e to the zero power right here, that's just equal to one. Uh, so we'll have one minus one in the parentheses, which means we'll have zero charge. That's what we would expect. There's no charge to start off. And then if we wait a really long time, this exponentially decaying part as t gets very big, as time gets very large, um, this part goes to zero so we'll just have one minus zero. And that means we're gonna reach, as time gets very large, some kind of maximum value. So we start at zero, and then we kind of asymptotically approach some maximum value. That's what's happening here. <clears throat> and in a similar kind of way, if you plugged in RC to this function, uh, you would see that you get 0.63 times Q naught. If you plugged in two RC for the time, you'd get 0.86 times Q naught. And if you plugged in three times RC for the time here, that would be one minus E to the minus three, you'd get 0.95. So basically just one minus these numbers from the current graph are appearing on the charge graph. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, let's talk about that RC thing. I was, I was telling you that you could think of RC as an amount of time that you plug into the equation. And oftentimes, uh, instead of just writing RC uh, in this exponent where it's e to the minus t over RC, instead what we'll do 
is introduce a constant called tau, okay? Tau is called the time constant of the RC circuit. Okay, so for the, the charge equation, we have QT equals Q naught minus one, or sorry, times one minus E to the minus T over tau. And then for current, we have IT equals I naught times E to the minus T over tau. Tau is just equal to R times C. It's just a shorthand way of writing R times C. And what the time constant tells you is how quickly does your circuit charge and discharge, okay? If you have a very small time constant, it means you charge and discharge very quickly. If you have a very large time constant, then it takes a long time to charge and discharge. So if you look at this, it might not be obvious that tau is some sort of time, but what I wanna show you is um, in SI, that R times C has units of seconds. So, okay, R has units of ohms and C has units of farads in the SI system. So R times C is ohms times farads, unit-wise. But remember that an ohm is a volt per amp, and a farad is a coulomb per, uh, coulomb per volt. So you can see volts are canceling right away. And we have coulombs divided by amps. But you should also remember that amps is the same as coulombs per second. So we have coulombs divided by coulombs per second. Coulombs cancel, and now we're just left with seconds. So all I'm trying to do here is convince you that yes, this is an amount of time. Uh, R times C has units of time, and that's what you'd expect. Okay, let's get a little bit of intuition for this. Remember, my claim is the time constant is telling you how quickly uh, charging and discharging happens. So it looks like the bigger the value of R, the longer the time constant, and also the bigger the value of C, the longer the time constant. Well, if R is bigger, there's more resistance. As we know, that means charge is gonna flow more slowly, and because charge is uh, flowing more slowly, it's gonna take longer to get some charge onto the capacitor or to get it off the capacitor in the case of discharging, right? And if we think about how the C term comes into play, well, if C is bigger, if you have a higher capacitance, that means the capacitor can hold more charge. So if the capacitor has more charge to hold on to, it's just gonna take longer to get it onto that capacitor. So that's why uh, tau equals R times C should make intuitive sense. Okay, so this is one for you to try out. I want you to take the charging equation uh, for RC circuits that we just uh, developed and use it in this example. So here we're gonna consider a charging RC circuit where the resistor R is 10 kilo ohms and the capacitor C is 10 microfarads. So the first question is, what is the time constant for this RC circuit? And a couple follow-up questions. How long will it take for the current to fall to 50% of its maximum value? And then how long will it take for the current to fall to 0.01% of its maximum value? So in the first question, you're calculating the time constant. That's pretty straightforward. In the second two questions, you're solving for a time, right? You wanna know how long does it take? What is the value of T such that the current reaches 50% of its max and 0.01% of its max, All right? So take a minute to try this out, pause the video, and see what you get. Okay, so let's go through it. Let's start with the time constant. This, this one's fairly straightforward. Remember, the time constant is given by the Greek letter tau. And it's just equal to RC, it's the resistance times the capacitance, that's it. Now, the resistance is 10 kilo ohms, so that's 10 times 10 to the three 
ohms. Okay, 10 to the 3 is the kilo unit prefix. Okay, uh, then we have C, which is 10 microfarads. Now, micro is 10 to the minus 6. And we have 10 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. So just to be clear, this is a 3 right there. Okay. So just calculate that. It's pretty straightforward. Works out to 0.1. And as I just showed you, an ohm times a farad is the same as a second. So 0.1 seconds is the time constant for this particular circuit. Okay, for the next part, we're going to remember our RC circuit charging equation uh, for current. So current as a function of time in an RC circuit that's charging is equal to I0, that's the maximum current at the very beginning, times e to the minus t divided by tau. So I'm going to start just by working this out uh, symbolically. Um, but remember, we're trying to solve for t here. So let's try to do that. We have i to, uh, sorry, i as a function of time divided by i naught equaling e to the minus t divided by tau. Okay. We're trying to solve for the time, so what we better do is take the natural log of both sides. Because when we take the natural log of both sides, we undo this exponent that you see here. And so we'll have natural log of current at time t divided by the starting current i naught. That's going to equal minus t divided by tau. So if we're trying to find a time, that's going to be minus tau times the natural log of the current at time t divided by i naught. Okay, so the, the second question after we found the time constant says, how long does it take to reach 50% of the maximum current. Well, that means the current at that time is equal to half, that's 50%, 0.5 I naught. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take T equals minus the time constant, 0.1 seconds. Then I'm going to take natural log of 0.5 I naught divided by I naught and then cancel out the i-naughts, really all you're computing is 0.1 times natural log of 0.5, and then take the negative of that. And if you punch that into your calculator, you're going to find that it works out to 0 0.069 seconds. So 0 0.69 seconds is how long it takes to reach half of the maximum current. Okay. For the other question, which is, how long does it take to reach 0.01% of the maximum current? That means the current at that time, so we're not going to work in percentages, we're just going to say it's 0 0.0001 times I naught. You, you basically have to take your percentage and divide by 100, just like we did here to get the fraction that goes in the front. But anyway, plug this in to solve for time. We get t equals minus 0.1 seconds, natural log of 0 0.0001 i naught divided by i naught, which cancels as before. So what you're punching into your calculator is minus 0.1 times the natural log of 0.0001 0001, and what that works out to is 92 seconds. So it takes a whole lot longer. Remember, what's going on with the current? It's exponentially decaying over time. So as we're getting to smaller and smaller values of the current, that's going to take a longer and longer amount of time. Okay, so that's what this is telling us.
Okay, so now we're going to look at discharging equations for RC circuits. What we've already worked out and done a few examples with is the charging equations. That means what happens with current and uh, the charge on the capacitor uh, when you connect it to a battery. Now we're going to look at what happens when we disconnect it from a battery and instead connect it to a resistor to allow it to discharge. Okay, So we're going to consider the same circuit that we saw earlier. The switch has been in position A for a very long time and the capacitor is fully charged. So we're going to say that the charge on the plates is plus or minus Q0. Remember Q0 is, is the maximum charge in our equations. Okay, so we have a fully charged capacitor. Then, at T equals zero, we're going to suddenly throw the switch to position B. And now we're going to allow it to discharge. And the question is, what happens then? So we, we throw the switch to position B. Now the battery is out of the circuit. It can no longer supply any charge to the capacitor. And now the capacitor is just connected in a loop with the resistor, as we saw before. That's going to make current start to flow in this direction. So current's going to come, uh, positive charge is going to move off of this positive plate. It's going to move in a loop around the circuit until it gets to this plate. So if you think about what's happening, we're losing positive charge from this plate and we're gaining positive charge on this plate, which means we're losing charge overall, right? Um, the Q value is, is getting smaller and smaller. Okay. So to analyze what's going on in this circuit, <coughs> we're going to apply Kirchhoff's loop rule once again. But this time we just have two things to think about in our loop. So let's take the loop uh, going this way, going clockwise. Let's start by going across the resistor. So if we go across the resistor in the direction of the current, the voltage is minus I times R. And then if we go across the capacitor, this time we're going from the negative plate to the positive plate, we have a positive voltage, and it's given by Q over C. That's the voltage across any capacitor. So we have minus IR plus Q over C equals zero. That's the loop rule. Okay, just like before, uh, this is a differential equation. And what I want us to do is solve that differential equation so we can figure out what Q as a function of time looks like for this discharging uh, capacitor and what I as a function of time, what the current looks like uh, for the same uh, circuit. So let's work that out. Okay, so we'll start with this. <coughs> So just copy down the loop rule equation that we had. We have minus I times R plus Q divided by C is equal to zero. Okay, we're gonna make a substitution here, which is, you know, the, the current I is related to the charge. It's the time derivative of the charge. But in this case, we have to be a little careful. I is actually equal to minus dq dt. The reason for that is uh, the charge q is decreasing. So since charge q is decreasing over time, the current is minus dq dt. Uh, we have to get that sign right for what comes next, okay? So what comes next is we just uh, sub in um, to our equation right here, um, I equals minus dq dt. So we have minus negative dq dt times R plus Q over C equals zero. And the next thing I'm gonna do to this is multiply through by C. Okay, so I'm going to have dq dt times rc, because I multiplied it across the board, and then we'll have plus q equals zero. Okay, 
So I can rearrange that a little bit more. Um, I can say dq divided by dt times rc equals um, minus q. And just to rearrange this a little bit more, what I want to do is separate out the time from the charge. So I want like the Q terms to all be on one side and I want the T terms to all be on the other side. So I'll have this. Um, I'm going to have DQ divided by Q. So I'm putting this Q over here. And then I'm going to put the time on the other side. So I'm going to have minus DT and then divide by RC like this. All right, so I'm just rearranging the equation. DQ over Q equals minus DT divided by RC, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is integrate both sides. And here's what that looks like. I have the integral DQ divided by Q equals the integral of minus DT divided by RC. Okay, so on the right-hand side, we have a time integral. Time is the variable inside. And remember, we start at t equals zero. That's the moment we begin to discharge. And then we end at some time t, which I'm not gonna be too specific about. It's just some arbitrary time t later. On the other side of the equation, we have this integral. Now, on the bottom limit, I have to use the value of Q that we start with. That's Q naught, right? So it's, I don't want to put zero down here because we're discharging a capacitor. It doesn't start off with zero charge. It starts off with charge Q naught, according to our previous notation. And then it ends up with some other charge QT. So, okay, we start at time zero with charge Q naught, and then we end up at some time T with charge QT. That's what's going on here with the limits. Okay, so we have the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Again, we'll just uh, do those individually to um, not have too much going on all at once. The right-hand side is very simple. Again, this is just a trivial integral. Uh, I have minus one over RC that I can immediately pull out. And then I go from zero to T uh, integral DT and that, of course, just works out to time. That just works out to T. So we'll have minus T divided by RC as our right-hand side. All right? For the left-hand side, we'll have the following. Um, we're going to have integral from Q0 to QT of DQ divided by Q. Now, in this case, I don't really need to do a U substitution or anything. I already can just look at this and see I'm integrating one over Q and that's gonna give me the natural log function as a result. So let's just jump right to that. We have natural log of Q evaluated from some starting value to some final value QT. Okay, so I have natural log QT minus natural log Q naught. And again, we're gonna use the division property of natural logs. This is the natural log of QT divided by Q naught. Just like that. Okay, so we'll take uh, right-hand side equals left-hand side, and then work out the result. We have um, the natural log of QT divided by Q naught equals minus T divided by RC. And of course, the idea here is we can get rid of the natural log and solve for QT if we take exponents of both sides. So we have E to the natural log QT divided by Q naught equals E to the minus t divided by rc. So uh, exponentiation undoes the natural log. So all we have is qt divided by q naught 
on this side and on the other side I'm just going to leave it as e to the minus t divided by rc. So that tells us qt equals q naught e to the minus t divided by rc. Okay? So what's this telling us? It's telling us that if we are discharging an RC circuit, the charge is in exponential decay. That's what you might expect, right? The charge is exponentially decaying over time. It's getting smaller as time goes on. And of course, um, just like before, we can find the current. So in this case, remember, I is equal to minus dq dt. And so if we take the, the negative of the time derivative of what we just found, here's how that's going to work out. Um, so I have a minus sign out front right at the outset. And then I have a Q naught as a constant in the front. And then when I take the derivative of e to the minus t over rc, take the derivative of this whole thing, it brings out a factor of minus 1 over rc. Okay? And then that's going to be multiplying e to the minus t divided by rc, just like this. Okay? But the next thing to realize is that Q0, uh, that's the maximum charge on the capacitor, that's just equal to epsilon times C. And we'll, we'll uh, cancel out these two negative signs. So we have epsilon C divided by R times C, then multiplying E to the minus T divided by RC. The C terms cancel in the front. We just have epsilon divided by R times e to the minus t over rc. In other words, we can just write that as i naught. Remember, this is our maximum current, epsilon divided by r. That's i naught times e to the minus t divided by rc. So we have current as a function of time and charge as a function of time for a discharging rc circuit. Okay, That's the result we wanted to get to. So let's summarize. These are the RC circuit discharging equations. Both current and charge are exponentially decaying as a function of time. So they both behave like this. You have some maximum value times e to the minus t over RC in both cases. Okay. So the current equation looks the same. We we'll start off at some maximum, we exponentially decay away. But this one looks different, the charge one looks different compared to the charging equation, right? When we're charging, Q is getting bigger over time. When we're discharging, Q is exponentially decaying over time. So that's a difference to just to note here. Okay, like before, we can take a look at what happens when we plot both of these functions out. We have I as a function of time equals I naught E to the minus T over RC. It looks like an exponential decay. And I already explained where these things come from, where these numbers on the graph come from, but just to reiterate, after one time constant, after time RC, what we get is e to the minus RC divided by RC, which is e to the minus 1, or 0.37. If you do e to the minus 1, that's 0.37 multiplying I0. So we start at t equals 0 with maximum current I0, but then after one time constant, it's fallen to 0.37 times I0. If you go two time constants out, it's 0.14 times I0. And if you go three time constants out, it's 0.05 times I0. That's just how an exponentially decaying function uh, behaves in this case. And for charge, it's the exact same thing. We have some maximum charge Q0 times this exponentially decaying piece. And so, uh, Basically, it's the same graph, replace I0 with Q0. Okay, so both current and charge are exponentially decaying when an RC circuit is discharging. That's the result. Okay, and so with that said, we can take a look at an example uh, that's shown here. Consider the circuit shown below. 
where epsilon is 18 volts, that's the battery right here. C is four microfarads, that's the capacitor. And then we have two resistors. R1 has a resistance, uh, that's this one right here, of five times 10 to the five ohms, whereas R2, that's the resistor over here, has a resistance of three times 10 to the five ohms. Initially, the capacitor is uncharged and the switch that you see here is open. If we close the switch, what we wanna do is find the current through resistor R1 after one and a half seconds. Okay, then we'll imagine a long time has passed and the capacitor is now fully charged. After a long time has passed and the capacitor reaches its uh, final charge, we open the switch, okay? So now the capacitor will be discharging and the question is, find the current through R1 one and a half seconds after the switch is reopened. Okay, so this problem is kind of just <clears throat> a direct application of the charging and discharging equations that we've developed, but you have to be a little careful because we have two different resistors and we have to really be careful about which R values are gonna be used in which context. So I'm gonna start with a general picture of the circuit where we have the capacitor over here, we have R1 up here, R2 down here, and then the battery over here. So we have C, R1, R2, and epsilon. This is the positive terminal of the battery. Down here is the negative terminal, which means for our capacitor, up here is the positive plate, and down here is the negative plate. Which way is current gonna be flowing? It's gonna be going this way. So that's our current I. And uh, there may be other currents in the circuit, like the current through R2, but we're not concerned with those right now. So I'm just labeling the one current that we actually care about which is the current going through this resistor R1 and then to the capacitor, okay? So here, the switch is closed at T equals zero. And when the uh, switch is closed, we begin to charge. So real quick, let's just Let's write down a loop rule equation for this uh, charging circuit, just so we can get a good sense as to what's going on. So for my loop, I'm gonna take this one going uh, counterclockwise, starting by going across the battery. And we're gonna take the outer loop of the circuit going counterclockwise like this. So first we're going across the battery. So we have epsilon positive, going from the negative to the positive terminal. Uh, then we go across the resistor in the direction of the current. So we have minus I times R1 for that. Then we go across the capacitor from the positive to the negative plate. So that's a voltage drop of Q divided by C. And that equals zero according to the loop rule. Okay. So what this is telling us, actually there's, there's, there's uh, one other fact I want you to keep in mind. The current I that we see here is just dQ dt, right? The, the bigger I is, the faster charge is building up on these plates. So I is dQ dt. And um, what this is basically telling us is our capacitor is charging through the resistance R1, okay? So in other words, we're going to write down our RC circuit charging equation where the capacitance is this C value right here and the resistance is R1. That's the only resistance that comes into play here, okay? So R2 is not relevant for this. So we have I as a function of time, 
equals epsilon divided by R1, that's our maximum current, times E to the minus T over R1 times C, okay? So the reason I went through the loop rule stuff is just to show you basically that it's only R1 that uh, the, cap the capacitor is charging through, okay? All right, so we have epsilon, that's um, 18 volts. Then we have R1, which is five times 10 to the five ohms, which is a volt per amp. That's multiplying E to the minus T divided by R1 times C. So the, the time in question, T is one and a half seconds. We wanna know what the current is a half, uh, one and a half seconds after we start charging. So that's the time we'll plug in. And then uh, R1 is five, 10 to the minus, sorry, 10 to the positive five. That's the resistance in ohms. And then the capacitance is four microfarads. So that's four 10 to the minus six farads. But if you do ohms times farads, that's just seconds. And we have the same unit uh, on the top and bottom. So we just have a pure number in the exponent. Okay, crunch those numbers, what you'll get is that this works out to 1.70, 10 to the minus five amps. That's how much current you have after one and a half seconds. Okay. Okay, now let's do the other part. So the next part says, um, a long time passes. And that means the capacitor is fully charged. Okay, it's fully charged to the voltage of our battery. So there's gonna be 18 volts across the capacitor just like there are 18 volts across the battery once uh, it's fully charged and current stops flowing. That's what's happening here. Uh, but then, Let's say at t equals zero, that's, it, that's our new t equals zero, the switch is reopened. And the switch, by the way, is up here in the circuit in case you forgot. So we're imagining now opening that switch. Basically what that does is it disconnects the battery from the rest of the circuit. The battery is no longer Part of our circuit once you open up this switch and it's just all of this connected together in a loop. So here's what it looks like. You have capacitor, you have R1 up here, and then you have R2 over here all connected in a loop. And again, the battery is no longer relevant to what's going on in the circuit. But we started off with a charged capacitor where there's a positive charge on the top plate and a negative charge on the bottom plate, which means there's current flowing this way, clockwise in our circuit, okay? If we do a quick loop rule equation, here's what we'll have. Let's start by going across the capacitor. Let's, let's take this loop that you see here uh, going clockwise. Uh, so we'll go across the capacitor from negative to positive plate, which gives us a positive voltage Q over C. Then we'll go across this resistor in the direction of the current. That's minus IR1. Go across the next resistor in the direction of the current minus IR2 equals zero. So my point is the current uh, that's coming off of the capacitor plates is actually discharging through both of these resistors, okay? So we could write this as Q divided by C minus I times R1 plus R2, which we could just call the equivalent resistance of the circuit, R1 plus R2. And uh, R1 was five times 10 to the five 
ohms, R2 was 3 times 10 to the 5 ohms. So 5 plus 3 times 10 to the 5 ohms, or 8 times 10 to the 5. Okay? So we were charging through a resistance of just 5 ohms. That was the previous step. But now we are discharging through a total resistance of 8 ohms. Okay? So if we write down our RC discharging equations, we'll have to take that into account. So here's what it's going to look like. The current as a function of time is equal to epsilon divided by the total resistance, which I'm writing as REQ, times E to the minus T over RC, but the R value is E, REQ as before. Okay, so here's what we have. Epsilon is 18 volts. The capacitor is charged to 18 volts to start divided by REQ, which is 8, 10 to the 5. An ohm is a volt per amp, so I'm just going to write it like that so we can see the units come out in amps at the end. And then we'll have E to the minus 1.5 seconds is still the time we're going to plug in here. And then we'll divide by R times C, so that's 8 times 10 to the 5 times 4 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so those are the values of R and C. Now, if you calculate this, if you plug in the numbers, you'll get 1.41 times 10 to the minus 5 amps. So it's not the same exact result as before, because again, uh, we're charging and discharging through a different amount of resistance. And the only way to really see that is just to write down a quick loop rule you don't have to go through the whole process of integrating to get you know, I as a function of time, but you just want to know what is the relevant value of C and R. That's how you're going to determine that is using the loop rule. Okay? So that was that example. Let's do one more. Uh, and in this example, it's kind of a practical application of RC circuits. Uh, this is where we use a capacitor as a backup power source. All right, so here's what's going on. We have a device shown here with a load resistance of 45 ohms. Okay, so this device can be whatever you want, maybe a computer, a motor, something that we want to keep powered uh, over time. It's connected normally to a 240 volt DC power source, uh, which you see over here. You can imagine this might be a battery of some kind. Okay, so epsilon is 240 volts. That's what we have over here. Okay, we also have a capacitor, which has a C value of 1.5 farads, which is serving as our backup power source in case the main one fails, okay? So imagine this, right? As it's shown right now, uh, our main power source is connected to our device. So it's able to supply a current to it. Right? But if for some reason we were just to knock out this main power source, right, just take it out of the circuit, um, we would still have our device connected to this capacitor. So the capacitor could now be supplying current um, to our device. That's, that's our backup power source. Okay, so C is 1.5 farads. All right. Let's also stipulate that the device is going to stop working properly, it's going to fail if the current supplied to it falls below 3 amps, okay? So it needs at least 3 amps of current to function properly. So let's say that at t equals 0, the main power source is disconnected. How long will the capacitor be able to supply power to the device before it stops working properly? And how much energy is used by the device in this time, okay? So first question is, if we knock out the main power source, um, how long does it take uh, before the current flowing to our device falls to 3 amps? And then as a backup, uh, how much energy does our device use in that time? Okay, from the moment 
when the power source fails to the moment where the current falls to 3 amps. Um, let's work both of these out. Okay, so let, let's just write down a few facts about this case. We know that when the power source is connected, The capacitor is charged um, to a voltage of 240 volts. In other words, if you looked at the circuit, we had the power source parallel with the capacitor. When they're connected in parallel, they have the same voltage. Okay. All right, now, when the power source is disconnected, we basically have an RC circuit which is discharging, okay? So when the power source is get disconnected, the capacitor is discharging. Through the device. Okay, so the discharging circuit looks like this. You have your capacitor and you have your device. And that's it. The main power source has been knocked out. So there's nothing else going on. So that's C, that's R. The capacitor starts off with a positive charge up here, a negative charge down here. And when current starts to flow from the capacitor to the device, it's going to flow this way. It's going to flow in the clockwise direction. Okay? If we go ahead and use the loop rule for this circuit, we're going to have Q divided by C going across the capacitor from the negative to the positive plate minus I times R going across the resistor equals zero. Okay, and we don't have to go any further. We know that if we did the rest of the work that we would see that we would obtain the equations for an RC circuit discharging, okay? And our RC discharging equation for current looks like this. The current as a function of time equals epsilon divided by R times E to the minus T over RC. Okay, so what we want to do here is solve for the time. We're interested in at what time T does the current go to 3 amps, okay? So you can see that the current is decreasing over time, so it's going to start at some maximum value and get smaller and smaller. At some point, it's going to fall to 3 amps. And what we're saying is that for this device, when the current falls to 3 amps is when the device stops working. So on the left side, where we have the current, I'm going to put in 3 amps. On the right side, I have epsilon, which is 240 volts, divided by R, which is 45 volts per amp. And then I have E to the minus T, divided by... R times C, R is 45, and uh, C is 1.5. So this is an ohm here. This is a farad here, but ohms times farads equals seconds. So I'm just going to write seconds. Okay. So now let's solve for T. Uh, let's rearrange this a little bit. Take the 45... Multiply it on both sides, so we have 45 times 3, divide by 240. All the units cancel, if you uh, keep track of that. That's going to be equal to e to the minus t divided by this number. 45 times 1.5, if you work it out, is 67.5 seconds. So next... Um, Let's take the natural log on both sides. 
because when we take the natural log of e to the minus t over 67.5 seconds, we undo the exponentiation. We just have minus t to the, uh, sorry, minus t over 67.5 seconds. If you crunch these numbers right here, 45 times 3 over 240, uh, that gives you 0.5625. Okay? So T is going to be 67.5 seconds times natural log of 0.5625. And there's, there's a negative sign in front. Forgot that. Okay. So crunch those numbers, you will get 38.84 seconds. And if we round that to the proper number of sig figs, which is 3, that's 38.8 seconds. So it takes 38.8 seconds um, where we can use this backup power source. And then after that, uh, the current's too small, so it's not going to work. Okay? Uh, so that answers the first question. The second question is basically how much energy is used by the device uh, basically from t equals zero, which is when it starts supplying current to the device after the main power source has been knocked out, all the way to 38.8 seconds which is when the device fails because there's not enough current going to it. All right, so I'm gonna show you a few different ways to think about this one. The first way is pretty simple, it's just like this. Um, the energy used by the device is coming from the capacitor. Okay, because the, the main power source is gone. If we imagine that main power source is a battery, normally there would be energy coming from the battery going into the device, but now that's not happening and the energy used by the device is coming from the capacitor. So that means the energy that our device uses, we can think of it as minus the change in energy stored in the capacitor. Because, of course, the capacitor is going to be losing energy. So this is going to be a negative change for the capacitor. That's why this negative sign is here. The device is gaining energy that the capacitor is losing. That's what this is saying. Okay? And then what's the energy stored in a capacitor in the first place? Well, it's given by this. We have Q divided by, or sorry, Q squared divided by 2C. That's the energy stored in a capacitor. So for the final energy, we have Q final squared divided by 2C. And for the initial energy, we have Q initial squared divided by 2C. That's the change in the energy stored in the capacitor right there. So to write this in a more simplified way, um, let's take the negative sign and distribute it into the parentheses, which basically switches the order of the terms. And then let's take 1 over 2c as a constant, which will pull out. So I'll have 1 over 2c times q initial squared minus q final squared. Okay, so let's work that out. q is the charge on our capacitor. We have RC circuit equations that tell us how Q behaves over time. So, because we have an RC discharging circuit, and we're interested in the charge that's held by the capacitor, um, that's given by Q of T equals Q naught times e to the minus t over rc, where q0 is just epsilon times c. So we can write this as epsilon times c times e to the minus t divided by rc. 
Okay? So what is the initial charge that's being held by the capacitor? Well, that's the charge at time t equals zero, which is epsilon c times e, plug in zero for the time, we have e to the zero power. And that's just one, by the way. Okay, so what do we have? We have 240 volts for epsilon. We have 1.5 farads, which is a coulomb per volt for the capacitance. And then we just have e to the zero, which is one. If you work this out, it's 360 coulombs. Okay, so the capacitor initially has 360 coulombs of charge that it's holding onto. But in the final state, this is where we plug in T equals the time we found earlier, 38.84 seconds. Uh, now here's what we'll have. We'll have 240 volts times 1.5 coulomb per volt times E to the minus 38.84 seconds, that's the time, divided by R times C, okay? So let's plug in the values of R and C. We have 45 is the resistance, and the capacitance is 1.5 ohms, and farads are the units, but remember ohms times farads equals seconds. So if we compute this, that's going to give us the final charge on the capacitor. And that works out to 202.5 coulombs. Okay. So if we go back to what we wrote earlier, remember the energy that's being used by our device is minus the energy stored in the capacitor, or I should say minus the change in energy stored in the capacitor which is given by this, 1 over 2c, q initial squared minus q final squared. So we have, for the energy used by the device, 1 divided by 2 times 1.5 farads, that's 1 over 2c, times q initial squared, which is 360 coulombs squared minus um, Q final squared, which is 202.5 coulombs, square that. Okay, so that's what we get when we apply this equation using the numbers we just computed. Okay, and if you work this out, you'll see it comes out to this. 2.95 times 10 to the 4 joules. Okay, so to summarize, we're using this backup power source for 38.8 seconds before the device fails. And in that 38.8 seconds, the device used 2.95 10 to the 4 joules worth of energy. Okay? Let me show you one more way to do this. And then we'll wrap it up. Here's another way to get the energy. We can think of the power consumed by the device as being given by I squared times R. So if we take the current flowing into the device squared and multiply it by R, that should give us the power consumed by it. And um, we know that the current that's flowing to it is given by epsilon divided by R times e to the minus t over rc. That's just something we established earlier because we have an rc circuit discharging. This is the current that's going to be in that circuit. Okay, let's also remember the definition of power. Power is the energy per unit time being consumed by our device. So we can write it as dedt. Power is the energy per unit time being consumed by our device. But like we said, that's equal to I squared times R. So I'm going to plug this in for I. Epsilon divided by R, E to the minus T over RC. I'm going to square it, and I'm going to multiply by R. 
which if we simplify, gives us um, on top epsilon squared divided by r squared, but then if you multiply by this factor, it's just divided by r. So we have epsilon squared divided by r. And then we have e to the minus t over rc squared. That's the same as putting a 2 in the exponent. So that's basically e to the minus 2t over rc. This is an expression for the power, okay? And that's the same as dE dt. Okay, so I want you to take this expression and this expression and look at them together. And basically what we can do is solve for dE by taking the dt over here and throwing it to that side. dE is equal to e squared divided by r, epsilon squared divided by r, um, times e to the minus 2t divided by rc, dt. Okay, that's what we have. And what we can do is integrate both sides. So I'll have the integral of dE, and then I'll have the integral of epsilon squared over r, e to the minus 2t divided by rc, dt. This is a time integral. We start at t equals zero. That's when we start using the backup power source at t equals zero. And then we'll go to some arbitrary time later, t. For the other side of the equation, the bottom limit is zero because if no time has passed, we haven't used any energy yet. And the top limit is the energy that we've used by time t. Okay? Now, this integral is really trivial. It just works out to energy used at time t. So we have the energy used at time t equals this whole integral, which we'll now do some work to uh, evaluate. Okay, so what we have is constants we can pull out, epsilon squared divided by r, and then we have integral 0 to t, e to the minus 2t divided by rc, dt. So that's not the worst integral to evaluate. Um, basically, if you have an exponential function and you integrate it, uh, you just get back the same exponential function as before. However, you have to bring down some factors from the exponent in front to make this all work out. So we have epsilon squared divided by r. The factors that come out when you integrate this thing from the exponent are minus rc divided by 2. And then we have the exponential function e to the minus 2t divided by rc. So that's, that's how the integral works out. It's right here. Uh, that is going to be taken from 0 to t. That's the uh, limits of integration. Okay? So, uh, here's what we have. Um, if we sort of collect the constants, we have minus epsilon squared times c divided by 2. Because we can cancel out the r factor here and here. And then we have, um, let's plug in the top limit. So that's e to the minus 2t divided by rc. We're plugging in t right here. And then let's plug in the bottom limit. We have e to the 0 power, right? We're just plugging in 0 as our bottom limit. And uh, e to the 0 power turns out to be 1. So this is minus epsilon squared times c divided by 2 times e to the minus 2t divided by rc minus 1. And we can take this negative sign and put it in the parentheses just by switching the order of the two terms. So let's just do that to make it look a little bit nicer. So the energy used by the device at time t is this. It's epsilon squared c over 2, 1 minus 
e to the minus 2t over rc. That's what we have. Okay? So now what we'll do is plug in the time in question. We want to use, we want to know how much energy was used by time t equals 38.84 seconds. That was the question. So epsilon is 240 volts. C, uh, we square that by the way. C is 1.5 uh, farads. And we're dividing that by two. And then we have one minus E to the minus two times this time, 38.84 seconds, divided by R times C. So this is all in the exponent. Um, R is 45 ohms and C is 1.5 farads and those units are seconds. I know this looks a little messy, but I'm trying to show you what's going on in the exponent. It's minus two times 38.84 divided by 45 times 1.5. So that's all in the exponent, okay? And if you crunch those numbers, guess what? You'll get the same answer we found before. 2.95 times 10 to the four joules. Okay, so that's how much energy is being used either way you look at it, okay? So that's gonna be it for today. And this is the end of the material that's gonna appear on the second test. So we finished our lecture on DC circuits. Just wanna point a few things out. As usual, we have some practice problems at the end of the lecture. I don't have time to get through these in class. So these are things you can do at home as you study for the test. A lot of good problems here, as well as in the end of the other lectures that we've done. So um, that's it. I'll see you next week. Take care.